Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your favorite quarterback hater, Robert Mathis, and you're listening to the For the Culture Podcast. This is the For the Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, with my man, Jason Spears. Before we get into our top five options for the Colts at quarterback in 2021, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Radio.com, iHeartRadio, Google Play, all your favorite podcasting platforms. Hit the like button, leave a comment, and turn on the notification bell so you get a notification every time we drop a podcast. There was a big trade last night between the Los Angeles Rams and the Detroit Lions, our number one option at quarterback for 2021 was involved in this trade. So it sucks. And there's a lot of negativity right now on Colts Twitter. But to be honest with you guys, when you look at what the Rams gave up in this deal, I had a sigh of relief. I did not want to give up all these picks, all these first round picks, a player, a third round pick to get Matthew Stafford. I like Stafford. I think he's a really good quarterback. I think he would have came to Indianapolis and thrived and really flourished under Frank Reich in this system, getting the ball off quick, staying healthy, great offensive line, great run game, great defense. I think he would have fit perfectly in Indianapolis. But Ballard's not going to get into a bidding war with a team and pay an astronomical amount When there's other options out there, we knew that from the get-go. I valued Matthew Stafford with the 21st overall pick and a future second. That probably would have been my limit. Maybe I would have gone with a fourth-round pick or a fifth-round pick in addition. I wouldn't have lost Stafford. If I'm willing to give up the 21st overall pick and a second-round pick in 2022, I wouldn't have lost him over a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh-round pick. But the meat and potatoes of my deal would have been one first-round pick and a future second round pick. I wouldn't have even wanted to do both picks this year because we still need a left tackle. We still need an edge rusher. We still need a boundary corner. So we still have needs on this team. And some of those will be taken care of, of course, in free agency. But this trade that the Rams made, in my opinion, is over the top. I would not have given up what they gave up. And I think we're in a better position to give up what they gave up than they are because they already... Don't have a first round pick this year in 2021 because that's part of the Jalen Ramsey trade. And they had so much invested in Jared Goff to add him to the deal. You almost have to take the picks that you invested in him into consideration here when you look at the overall value of this trade. So the Los Angeles Rams send two first round picks, a third round pick and Jared Goff to the Lions for quarterback Matthew Stafford. And when they made that trade to move up to first overall with the Titans back in the 2016 draft, they gave up two first round picks, two second round picks, and two third round picks. So could it work? Yes. But if it doesn't work, it's going to blow up in your face and you're going to look at a six to 10 year rebuild and you're going to set your franchise back. So it could all be justified if they go out and win a Super Bowl in the next three years. If they don't win a Super Bowl, They're going to set that franchise back. You add the Goff trade to the Stafford trade to the Cooks trades, the two trades where they traded for him and then they traded him away and they lost value. Of course, when they brought him in, he played. They traded him to Houston. They lost value there. And then the Ramsey trade. When you add all those trades up, they're going to go from 2016 to 2024 without a first-round pick. And the only first-round pick in that time frame will be Jared Goff, who's now gone, and will be in Detroit. So... I wanted Matthew Stafford. I wanted Ballard to trade for Matthew Stafford. I am very thankful he did not give up what the Rams just gave up because as much as I like Stafford, he was not worth the value in my opinion. No question. I mean, that's insane. It's absolutely insane. I mean, two first round. I mean, I was willing to part with one. That was it. Like once you get into player, two first round picks, a third round, like it, it's a wrap. And I like Matthew Stafford, but the only type of the only type of talent that I give all of that up for is to get into the top five of the draft yep. to get your franchise quarterback. If you see one there. And so you just, there's no way you just don't do it. I trust Ballard to do the right thing all the time. And I, I mean, there's just, there was no way he was going to do that for, I mean, and listen, I love Matthew Stafford. I think it would have been great in our offense. I think he would have helped us. I think he would have led us to the playoffs and probably a lot of big things. But you just cannot do that. That's 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 the kind of deal where if you make that deal, it looks good now maybe for the season, but five years from now, it, it probably looks bad. Yep. So when I saw what they gave up, I was ecstatic that Ballard did not give that up because that's the type of haul you give up for a young franchise-type guy, not a 32-year-old guy that's on the backside of his career. So yep. I love Stafford. 
I love everything he's about. I love the fact that he wanted to go anywhere but New England. Um, <laughs> I think that's great. Uh, makes me like him even more. But at the end of the day, like Chris Ballard values his draft capital, and he's not going to give it up for a guy that is on the backside of 30. And so, um, you know, I know a lot of people were frustrated, and now they're like, well, what's – you know, what's he going to do? Like, uh, you know, or we, I mean, I saw insane things about Jacoby coming back. And by the way, Jacoby's not under contract. He's not going to be re-signed. I've been told that. So you people can stop talking about it. That's not going to happen. I've seen Nick Foles name thrown out there. That's not going to happen. Ballard is not an incompetent moron. He's going to find the guy that he and Frank Reich and that staff think give them the best chance this year and in the future to win. It's that simple. And I know that that he didn't go into this with one plan. And if Matt Stafford, he didn't get them, then, oh, 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 shit, we have no plan. Like, there's plan A, plan B, probably plan all the way down to, to, to like, W. So I'm not worried. I'm honestly, like, I was I was telling somebody last night on Twitter, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not nervous, I'm not concerned, because every time Chris Ballard, has had a chance to attack a weakness and had a whole offseason to do it, he's come up big. So I expect him to come up big. It, it, who knows? It could be something out of left field that no one's even talking about. So he made the right move. You know, we, we move on to whatever, you know, his second plan is or plan B is, and we'll, we'll go from there. Who knows? Plan, plan A might not even have been Stafford. Plan yep. A might still be going on. So we'll move on. It's a part of the league. Things happen. You don't always get your way. You, you just keep it moving. I have full trust in this staff. One thing I do know is that we have one of the top three GMs in the game, and as much as I've I've said I don't agree with certain things Reich does in the red zone, there's nobody that I trust more to get the most out of a quarterback than him. So whatever quarterback comes in here, I know is going to play their best football. So that I do know, that I do believe, and so I'm not worried, Luke. I don't know how you feel, but I'm certainly not – I'm really not concerned. No, nah, not at all. And we have our fair share of issues with Frank Reich. We have our disagreements throughout the course of the season, whether it be red zone offense, goal line offense, a third and two call, a fourth and one call, a personnel grouping, a play we just disagreed with in the moment, being a little too overly aggressive, too analytical. But his bread and butter is quarterback development. I will never say a bad word about Reich's ability to develop quarterbacks and to get the most out of his quarterback so that's absolutely not a concern of mine in any way shape or form but when you look at this trade it's just so mind-blowing to me the value because you take all the picks they gave up for Goff in 2016 and then the picks they gave up yesterday in this deal in addition to Goff to get Stafford it's just crazy to me and it all goes into don't reach for a quarterback we're going to talk about later in this podcast when we get into our top five Our top five options, of course, we're going to talk about trading up and drafting a franchise quarterback in the first round, whether it be Justin Fields or Wilson or Lance or Jones, whoever it might be in the first round. If Ballard's guy's not there, I don't want to trade up. I don't want to reach because when you reach for a quarterback, you set yourself back. You tie yourself down. It's like a bad relationship. You tie yourself down to somebody you don't really want to be with. For the next five to ten years. And that's what happens when you get in bed with a franchise quarterback in the first round. And you trade up, especially if you trade up, to go get that guy. So when you take all that value and you look at that trade back in 2016. Two firsts, two seconds, and two thirds invested in Jared Goff. They sent a first round pick to Tennessee. You look at that 2017 draft. The Rams would have been drafting fifth overall. That pick goes to the Titans. And Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson are both on the board at five. So the Rams would have had an opportunity to draft Patrick Mahomes with their pick at five. You could have had a 21-year-old Patrick Mahomes with a 32-year-old Sean McVay together in Los Angeles. And you could have kept the other three first-round picks, the two second-round picks, and the three third-round picks. Instead, you have a 33-year-old Matthew Stafford, and you have none of those first-round picks, none of those second-round picks, none of those third-round picks. So I like Stafford. He's a good player, but that's why you don't reach. You look at the New York Giants. Two years ago, they drafted Daniel Jones. They have a terrible year his rookie season. 
and they passed the next year on Justin Herbert. So if you just didn't reach for a quarterback the year before and you waited one year, you could have had Herbert. And it's the same thing with Washington. They take Dwayne Haskins. He's an absolute bust. They've already cut him. And last year, second overall, they passed on him to take Chase Young. Now, Chase Young's a great player. He's going to be a superstar in this league and all pro for many years to come. But he's not a quarterback. And Washington could have taken a pass rusher instead of Haskins. And then the gap between him and Young would have been a lot closer than the gap between a cuttable quarterback who they already cut in Haskins and Justin Herbert, who looks like he's going to turn into a superstar quarterback. And the value of the quarterback position is just so much greater than an edge rusher. So you look at the Giants reaching for Daniel Jones. You look at Washington reaching for Dwayne Haskins. You look at the Rams trading up and reaching for Jared Goff, and all of it's blown up in each one of those organizations' faces. The Rams, we haven't seen it yet because they're still competitive, but they have a lot of losing football ahead of them if this experiment doesn't work out with Matthew Stafford because they're going to go like a decade without a first-round pick. That's just crazy value. and That's not Chris Ballard. So anybody expecting Ballard to do that, it was never going to happen. And when we look forward now to the 2021 draft, I don't expect Ballard to just throw the kitchen sink at a franchise quarterback in the first round just to get a quarterback to get a quarterback. That's not how Ballard rocks. That's not how Ballard rolls. So I know a lot of people just want the Colts to trade up to trade up, and we're going to get into that. But when I look at the value for Goff, you could have got Patrick Mahomes the next year at five, and you could have kept all those first-round picks, all those second-round picks, and all those third-round picks. Same thing with the Giants and Daniel Jones and Herbert, and then the same thing with Washington. They could have had Herbert, too. Instead, they have Dwayne Haskins, who they've cut just two years into his NFL career. No question, Luke. And, and one thing I would say, uh, Detroit's doing this the right way. I, I think they won this trade hands down. They got draft capital. I, I still think there's a chance that they're going to try to flip golf, which I will talk about when we get into our top five you know, options for quarterback. And he's not my number one option, but he is on my list. I, I do think there's going to be teams that will look at golf and want, and want to, you know, looking for a quarterback that will, will call Detroit about him. Obviously, he's got a hefty contract. You might have to take a pick back, whatever. I don't know. But as far as the trade from Detroit side, I just think it's it's a home run. I mean, they they get two more picks. I mean, for me, like, I'm one of these guys, when you tear it down, you tear it all the way friggin' down. And so you get rid of all your good players, and you start over, and you do that, and you build through draft capital. When Ballard came here, that's exactly what he did. I just I like I like what Detroit did. I think they won the I think they won the trade. I think the only way to me the only way the Rams win or or if this is even an equal trade is if they win a Super Bowl in the next three years. And if that doesn't happen, then they're in deep trouble because they're they're I mean their their salary cap and everything else it's just it, it it's just going to be a disaster. That's what I expect to happen. I don't think they're going to win a Super Bowl, and I think it's going to be it's going to end up being a big trade win for Detroit, which is weird for me to say because I'm used to them screwing everything up. But I do think they made the right decision here. Again, I think they're going to probably try to flip golf and draft a quarterback for their future. Don't know who that'll be, but we shall see. Either way, I still think they won this trade. Yeah, I agree. I definitely think they won this trade. And hey, the Rams didn't have to give up any kneecap. Kneecap. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's a positive for the Rams. They didn't have to give up any uh, limbs, and Dan Campbell didn't get a chunk out of them at any point during this trade. But that's also because they didn't get knocked down. Had they have knocked them down and won this trade, he probably would have taken a chunk out of their kneecap on the way back up. But let's get into the top five quarterback options for the Colts this offseason to start. I do think multiple things on my list, at least, could happen. And we'll start off with number five. I have Jacob Eason. Drafted him last year in the fourth round. I don't think this is going to happen. I don't think he's going to be the starter. This is absolute last case scenario of realistic options. If he develops, you bring in, you still probably have to do something else on this list. Like you probably have to bring in a guy like Ryan Fitzpatrick, a veteran that could start and then eats him, blows him out of the water in August. And maybe even not by week one, but by week four or five, and then becomes your starter down the stretch. So I don't think this happens, but he's on the roster. He's the only quarterback under contract right now, so I think that he has to at least be on the list, at least within the options, to start in 2021. I don't think it's going to happen, but I'll put him on there. And I wish Colt fans could just have normal takes on Jacob Eason. There's a lot to like. There's also a lot of unknowns and a lot not to like. And it just seems to me like everybody is really far one way or the other 
on Jacob Eason. There's very few and far in between good takes where people take him for what he is. He's a fourth round pick. He's six foot six. He has a big arm, but we haven't seen him yet. He didn't play a lot in college. He's a very unique, raw kind of guy. And it just seems to me like when I see takes on Jacob Eason on Twitter, people either think, oh, he's the greatest thing. We should start him right away. Let's see what he has. Or people completely hate this guy irrationally. So it's either irrationally great or irrationally terrible. And when you listen to Ballard talk, they like him. They're not over the moon. He's not the greatest thing since sliced bread, but he's also not a trash can. So they're somewhere in between. I think we should be somewhere in between. I think the last resort should be Jacob Eason. If it's to me between Jacob Eason or Jacoby Brissett coming back, if I'm going seven to nine, I'd rather go seven to nine with Jacob Eason. Give me the young guy who could turn into something, who could turn into a franchise quarterback over a guy who we've seen twice. We saw him in 2017. We saw him in 2019. We know exactly what he is. There's no future. There's no upside. The ceiling is you could jump and touch the ceiling. I don't want that. I want a guy who at least could give me something. If I'm going to lose, give me some glimmer of hope that there could be some future there with that guy. So number five, I'm going Jacob Eason. Yeah, it's funny. Jacob Eason's not on my list because I incorporated him into into my number five option, which is it's a tie. Going out and signing Jameis Winston, who I think is an immensely talented quarterback, to a one-year deal, and then having him and Jacob Eason fight it out. Whoever plays best in training camp wins the job. I, I would hope Jameis Winston would win it. I think I think with the right coaching, Jameis Winston – can be successful in this league. He's certainly shown he's capable of it, but he's also shown that he can be a turnover machine. And and I think if anybody could coach the best out of uh, out of Jameis Winston, I think Frank Reich is the guy. I like his mobility. He can move around. He's got a great arm. He makes a lot of throws. I mean, he tore us up when we played him. He did throw three interceptions, but he still found a way to win. So that's one of my guys in, in the fifth spot. And my other guy is trading for Gardner Minshew. And I mentioned this as an outside-the-box option on Twitter, and I, a lot of people were like, he sucks, he's blah, blah, you know, all that kind of stuff, because they just look at the name and they look at the team. But if you go deeper than that and you watch the guy play, he's got some things that you really like. He can move around, he can throw on the run, he can, th- you know, he, he would fit, I think he would be a good fit for the type of offense we run. He doesn't turn the ball over a lot. And again, he could compete with Jacob Eason in training camp. You give Jacob Eason the chance to win the job, but you expect for you know Gardner Minshew and or Jameis Winston to win the job. So those would be my two options for, for fifth, and you have Jacob Eason in the equation too, so it's kind of like three guys because those guys would be competing with him. You're not just handing them the job. So for me, my fifth option – Jameis Winston or trading because he wouldn't cost a lot for Gardner Minshew and then having them compete with Jacob Eason and hopefully beat out Jacob Eason because that's – or, you know, honestly, whoever wins it, wins it. Honestly, if Jacob Eason turns into the guy, then he's the guy. But th- that would definitely be my fifth option, the last option on my list. For number four, I put trade up or draft a quarterback at 21. Now, the reason I put this so low is because I'm looking at this top five as our week one starter or our starting quarterback for the bulk of – of the 2021 season. And because we have a win now roster, I am hesitant to give Jacob Eason a shot or to draft a rookie and start them right away. Because I think that even if you did this, like even if we did number four and we traded up or we drafted a quarterback at 21, there still might be free agent options out there where they could come in and give you a better chance to win this year, where you let this guy develop kind of like last year with Jacob Eason developing, being a fourth round pick, of course, and then having Phillip Rivers. So if you bring in a guy again, like Ryan Fitzpatrick, who I don't want Fitzpatrick here, that's not an ideal option, but he might give you a better chance to win the month of September and you bring him in. He's your week one starter. He starts the month of September and then maybe the rookie takes the baton during the year, kind of like last year. We saw that with Tua and Fitzpatrick down in Miami and Fitzpatrick played well. And then later in the season, he actually came in and won a couple games for them at the end. So I think that is kind of an option. But the reason I put this so low also is because knowing Chris Ballard, he's not going to trade. Like there's a lot of Colt fans that just want to trade up to trade up, get the quarterback, just like get the guy. We don't need to do that. Like you don't need to get gas when you have three quarters of a tank. Like you don't always need to be in a rush to fix everything. Sometimes you're better off letting everything take its course. 
I'm not into just taking a guy to take a guy. Oh, we have to move up and get a quarterback because it's the right thing to do because he's a quarterback because we need that position to be locked in now. You're better off being patient. If you're patient, that next Patrick Mahomes could fall to you the following year. That next Justin Herbert could fall to you the following year. And I know a lot of people are going to say, well, Luke, they were drafting fifth overall in 2017. Or Luke, the Giants were drafting fourth or third, and the Redskins were drafting second or third. I understand that. And, of course, next year we'll probably be in the late teens, early 20s, mid-20s again. I get that. But the point is, guys fall. Next year, let's say the next Patrick Mahomes falls to 15, and we're drafting 22nd. It's a lot easier to move up those seven picks and get that guy next year. So I want Ballard to know it's the guy. I want that player to scream franchise quarterback. Maybe that guy's in this class, and I'm not even getting into the names of Fields and Wilson and Jones and Lance and all the guys that will be there or could be there or will be in maybe a vicinity to trade up. It all comes down to does Ballard see that guy as the guy, yes or no? But I would put this at four right now because even if you do this, that guy still might not be ready to start week one of his rookie season. Even Patrick Mahomes a couple years ago did not start as a rookie in 2017. So number four, I would put trade up, draft a quarterback, perfect world. We get a franchise quarterback in the first round. The world's not perfect, and I don't want Ballard to reach. Everybody should have learned their lesson. You look at the Rams, you look at the Giants, you look at the Redskins, do not reach for a quarterback and I think we don't have to worry about that with Chris Ballard because Ballard's not a reacher by any stretch of the imagination so that's my fourth option trade up draft a quarterback to start them week one yeah my fourth option is trading for Sam Darnold I I like Sam Darnold I think he definitely under the tutelage of Frank Wright could definitely revitalize his career but the problem I see with this is it's going to take him some time And we're ready to win now. I think it's going to take Darnold some time to get adjusted to our offense, get adjusted. And we just don't know what the the offseason is going to look like. We still don't really know. Hopefully, training camp and all that stuff will go back to normal. I mean, we're moving in that direction. That's what we're hoping, but we just don't know for sure. But I do think it's going to take Darnold a little bit of time to get adjusted and all of that. So I don't know if he'll come out the gate playing great. But I do think his upside is still the. I still believe in the kid. He's got great athletic traits. He can make all the throws. He's just got to get into this offense, be coached by a guy that knows what he's doing, not Adam Gaze, and somebody that knows quarterback play mechanics, all that stuff, knows how to read defenses. And he's got to be able to take all the things that Frank Reich teaches him and apply that to the field. Now, that's not going to happen overnight because he's been in the – a terrible situation for the first few years of his career. So he's going to be at the, he's going to have to be coached out of a lot of bad habits and, and uh, these things don't happen overnight, but I still think this kid has a chance to be a really, really good NFL quarterback. And yes, I've seen the jets film and yes, I've seen the interceptions and the bad decisions and all that. I've seen it all, but he was in a situation on a team with no defense, no playmakers for the most part and a terrible head coach. You put him in a situation with a with a with a top ten defense, a great offensive line, a running game, and a really good offensive minded head coach. I think he's got a chance to completely change his career trajectory, and he's still on a rookie contract. And I think he can be gotten for a lot less than than you know, obviously a ton less than what the the Rams gave up to get Stafford. So he's my number four option. Uh, the only reason he's not higher is because I do think it's going to take some patience from Colt fans. And we all know most sports fans have no patience and Colt fans are no different. So that's why he's fourth and not higher, but I wouldn't be against this. And you could, I mean, you could even bring him in and let him again, like I mentioned with my number five options, you could let him compete with Jacob Eason. If he, if he doesn't play well enough, maybe you play Jacob Eason. I don't know. I think Sam Darnold beats him out though, to be honest with you. And so you, you you would give him the starting job. But that's my fourth option. I still believe in that kid. I still I still think he's a great talent. It's just all – everything in this league – and, Luke, we've talked about this. It's all about the environment you're in, the situation you're in, and the team around you, especially when you're a young quarterback. If you're in – if you're on a team, which generally you are on a team that's bad, but they continue to be bad and they don't add anything to the roster like they did with Darnold, you have no defense, 
you have a bad head coach, uh, bad coordinators, and you know no running game, no receivers, no no offensive line. Like, I mean, he had nothing in New York. So I really think you give him a clean slate in Indianapolis. You just, I mean, with Reich, and I mean, he's the talent just didn't go away, man. He still got it. Uh, he, I mean, even in our game, we beat the crap out of him. But that one drive he had. You saw what the guy's capable of. That run that he had, the, the rollout and the throw, where you avoided the sack and the throw into the end zone, there's not a lot of guys that can make that play. Sam Darnold can. So you get him in here with Frank Reich, I think you would get the most out of him, and I think you'd see a guy whose career com- trajectory completely changes. So that's my number four option, Sam Darnold, trade New York Jets. My number three option, and I kind of tiered these with like a bunch of players where if I really were to put a list together of 15 guys or something like that, guys in individual tiers would probably be in different orders. But I kind of just ordered it like Eason, then trade up, then free agent. So my third tier is a bunch of different free agent guys who I think would make sense. One of them being Jameis Winston. I think Winston could come in here. I think Wright could probably get him to minimize the turnovers. And I always thought with Jameis Winston, he was in the best system and the worst system for him when he was in Tampa because he was in a system that is relentless, aerial attack, boom, 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 downfield. And that's great because he fits that. He's got the big arm. He has that relentless ability to attack downfield and just be careless with the football. Now, that's good and bad because careless with the football also means you're going to turn the ball over a ton. That's why he threw 30 touchdowns and 30 picks because he was just like, you know, everything was just attack, 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 attack. And I think if you took his talent and you got away from Bruce Arians and you got into a Frank Reich offense and you started to take what the defense gives you and tone back a little bit, I think it could work. And if you get him on a one-year deal, he's still so young. He's a former number one overall pick. You get him in here. If it works out, you re-sign him. He could be a franchise quarterback. He has plenty of time to evolve into a franchise quarterback. So I don't think he's there yet, and I think that's why you bring him in on a one-year deal and then you have him earn it. Like last year, he would have had an opportunity, but he went to a team that obviously had a quarterback in Drew Brees, and then I didn't like what happened with Taysom Hill. Personally, I would have started him in those games, and he kind of lost a year of his career there, and he's probably pissed that he signed there because he could have went somewhere else and he probably could have had a better opportunity, but he goes to a team that has an aging Hall of Fame quarterback. Good chance that guy gets hurt at some point. He does get hurt, and then they go to a tight end and they bring him in at quarterback. So I would like to see us give Winston a shot because it's low risk, high reward. One-year deal, you're not going to pay him a lot, three, $4 million, whatever it might be. You bring him in. Whatever he got last year, you probably give him a very similar contract to what the Saints gave him. You bring him in on that one-year deal, and you let him start. Fitzpatrick, another guy, seasoned vet, not going to be a long-term option, not going to be a franchise quarterback. But I like the idea of Fitzpatrick maybe with Jacob Eason or with a rookie because you have a smart Harvard graduate, veteran guy, journeyman, played for a bunch of teams, can still play at a high level. I don't know if I'd be comfortable with him being the quarterback the entire season, but at least to get you off to a good start. And I think it could be parlayed. You bring in Sam Darnold, maybe he's not ready to start right away, or you just want to bring in some competition on top of Eason in the summertime during training camp. You have a smart vet like Fitzpatrick. You have Darnold. You have Eason. One of them gets cut over the summer. Maybe it's Patrick. Maybe it's Eason. Then you go into the season like that. And then Jimmy G. If Jimmy G gets released from the 49ers, I don't know what they're going to do yet. If I were them, I probably wouldn't cut him. But Jimmy Garoppolo has to be, he's kind of like Eason in a way. He's so overrated and so underrated at the same time. He's 24-8 and as a starter. He's been to a Super Bowl two years ago, technically last year, this time last year. He went 13-3. and He made the playoffs. They went to the Super Bowl. This year gets hurt. I think he finished 3-3, and only played six games, and all of a sudden he falls off a cliff. Nobody wants him anymore, and all of a sudden he sucks. So Jimmy Garoppolo is one of those up-and-down guys. He could take what the defense gives him. I think he would fit the Frank Reich offense with a good run game, a good offensive line, a basic offense where you just get the ball out quick like he did in New England. I think he'd work. I think it would work, but I wouldn't trade for him. He would have to get cut. Well, you know, the contract's not bad. I would trade for him. I would give up a late-round pick for him. Or if he were to get cut, I would definitely pick him up and sign him. I do not want Cam Newton. I think he's completely finished. I would not want Andy Dalton. I thought he looked awful last year with the Cowboys. I don't want Mitch Trubisky. But for me, when I look at the free agents, 
I'm thinking Winston, Fitzpatrick, Jimmy G. If I had to put him in order, I'd put Jimmy G first, but I don't think it's going to happen because I think he stays in San Francisco. Winston, two, because of the upside, like Garoppolo. And then Fitzpatrick, third. I don't really want Fitzpatrick. I just put him in that class because the way I ordered it with trade-up, free agent trade. So just I put him in that class of free agent guys. who You bring him in, one-year deal. There's no risk. It's a downgrade from Rivers, which sucks, but you bring him in on that one-year deal, and he could give you a couple good weeks. He could compete. And then if you have, whether it be Eason or a rookie or whatever, you have a smart veteran guy who's been around the league and could teach him a lot because they say he taught Tua a bunch of stuff last year. So just to get that veteran presence in the quarterback room, it might be a good idea. Because let me go back to number four. If we trade up and draft a rookie, I absolutely do not want my rookie to be with Jacob Eason. I do not want my quarterback room to be Jacob Eason and a rookie quarterback. There's just too much inexperience in that room. I would want a veteran guy like Fitzpatrick in the room just to balance things out on top of Frank Reich and his expertise and Marcus Brady and everybody we got. So number three, I would go with a couple of those low risk, high reward, one and done free agents. Yeah, for me, my number three option is uh, Jared Goff or Jimmy Garoppolo. Both of them have a lot of experience. They played winning football. They played in the playoffs and won. They've gone to the Super Bowl. They didn't win, but they played in the Super Bowl. They play good football in this league. So trading for one of those guys, I wouldn't trade a ton for them because of the contracts, but uh, I don't think either one's going to be be released. But if they were released, I'd certainly, you know, certainly look at it. But those two guys, I think, are around the same. Uh, maybe Goff's a little better, but uh, I definitely think that both of those guys would come in here. I think Reich would coach them up, and they'd be fine. I think we could we could, we'd easily win the division with either one of them. We could win in the playoffs with them. I don't know if we could win a Super Bowl with them. Probably not. I don't. I'm not sure. I mean, Goff they they've gone to Super Bowls, so if you put the right talent around them, you can definitely go to a Super Bowl because they've proven it. So. I wouldn't give up a ton for either one of them because of the deal with golf. I might even ask for another pick. I mean, I'm asked to take that to contract. I might ask for a pick as well. Like as far as, you know, we'll trade one pick to you and you give us a pick and golf because that contract is, is nuts. But those, those two guys, I think, you know, you get the experience they're going, I still think they're going into their prime. They're young. They're solid. They're not bad. I mean, they're not top five quarterbacks by any stretch, but they're not bad. And I still think their best football is ahead for both of them. And I think they would both fit in our offense really well. So that's definitely my number three option. But um, again, I mean, I'm not trade. I'm not trading a ton for them. So you know, it depends on what they ask for. You're not getting much. A fourth, maybe. I mean, I don't. I wouldn't go super high with either one of these guys. No, there's no way I would trade a first and maybe not even a second. So unless I'm getting a pick back. So that would be my number three option though. I do like both of these guys. I think you can win with them. I think you can win divisions with them. I think you can go to the Super Bowl with them because they've done it. And we we're continuing to accumulate talent. Ballard is going to just keep getting up. This roster is just going to keep getting better and better. So uh, those would be my two guys for the third option. Yeah, it's funny because I kind of grouped those guys together. Same division, both went to a Super Bowl the last couple of years. wasn't really because of them, but they could play at that level. They could play in the playoffs to have experience. The contracts are crazy different, though, and I didn't know that until this week. That Jimmy G contract, you could get out of that for like 2 or $3 million dead cap. And then yeah, the, the golf one's nuts. The golf one's nuts. The golf contract is so bad that I think they had to give up extra picks. Like, I think that third-round pick was in addition to, please take this contract off our hands, we'll give you a third-round pick. So, right. if I'm trading well, that's for why Goff, I'm saying That's why I'm saying if we trade for Goff, we're, we're, they're going to have to send us a pick. It'll almost be – Goff's way more talented, but it will almost be like that Houston trade with Brock Osweiler. Remember, they almost gave more – in the trade plus Osweiler to get less just back, to get rid, yeah, just to get, to rid, get of rid of the contract. contract. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't love the. I mean, honestly, I don't love the. Obviously, I don't love the contract. If I could, you know, if it was be they'd so much, give, they basically have to give you him. I mean, really? I mean, seriously? Yeah, they would have to, and they'd have to include a pick. Yeah, and I'm sure. not knocking your list because he's even higher on my list. Number two is trade. I would trade for Sam Darnold. Carson Wentz, Gardner Minshew, 
Jared Goff, but they're all so much different because I think that there's a high ceiling for Sam Darnold. I think there's not much of a market for Gardner Minshew. And then I think Wentz and Goff are very similar, same draft class, one and two. They're both talented. They've both had their ups and downs and are currently on a low while making big time elite money. So I don't really want Wentz, but I know that Frank Reich has gotten the most out of him. I don't really want Jared Goff, but we've seen him go to a Super Bowl. And the reason I put these two guys in this tier is just because it's my trade tier, so I have them in the same tier. But both guys would need to come with picks. If I'm trading for Carson Wentz, the trade would almost have to be lopsided without Wentz in it where I'm getting more than the Eagles. So it'd almost be like, you're paying me to take him off your hands because if it doesn't work, I'm going to have to eat that contract. And it would be the same thing if we make a trade with the Lions for Jared Goff. So I don't want them really as quarterbacks, but value-wise, knowing that they've played at a high level before, knowing that they're young, they both have multiple seasons. I think they're both 26 or 27. I think Goff is 26 and then Wentz might be 27, but they both have multiple seasons before they turn 30. So I would take them off their respective teams' hands, but you would need to give me picks where if it doesn't work out, the trade is still a winnable trade for me. So Wentz, that's almost tier, to be honest, those two belong in their own tier. I'd probably put them in tier maybe three and a half, then tier three, then tier two with Sam Darnold and Gardner Minshew. And Sam Darnold and Gardner Minshew are much different players like in terms of where they're at in their careers. Because of where they were drafted, like you look at Sam Darnold, he was the third overall pick in 2018. I think he has a lot of talent. I really do. There's a couple throws at the end of the 49ers game. There was a couple throws in our game. And you just look at the situation he was drafted into. The New York Jets, an awful franchise, awful organization. They didn't put anything around him. They never got him playmakers. He never had a run game. He never had a defense. You had that terrible coaching staff with Greg Williams coaching the defense, the D.C., and then... Obviously, Adam Gaze with the bug eyes and just everything from the opening press conference with the tacos, floating eyes all over the press conference up until his final game. It was just an absolute disaster for Adam Gaze in New York. And then you look at what happens with Ryan Tannehill, who I don't think has as much talent as Sam Darnold. He goes off after he gets away from Adam Gaze in Miami. He goes to Tennessee. Now he's become a franchise quarterback. He went to an AFC championship game last year and went to the playoffs and won the division this year, went to the playoffs and back-to-back years, won the division this year. And I think Sam Darnold could have an even higher upside than Tannehill post gaze. So if he's available and we could get him for a third round pick, I would be all over it. I would do a second round pick. I probably wouldn't go up to a first round pick, but if I could do a second and a fourth or something like that, a third, maybe two thirds, I would like to do something like that to get Sam Darnold. I think he has a lot of talent left in him or in him and he has a lot of football good football left in him his best football is yet to come and then Gardner Minshew has become some sort of meme because of the mullet because of the handlebar mustache because he plays in Jacksonville because of his entire college career where he goes to four teams in four years he breaks his hand on a beer bottle he's a weird guy interesting guy definitely fits the city of Jacksonville and Duval County but I think he'd fit in Frank Reich's offense. I really do. And what I like about him is what I like about a lot of the guys on my list and the way I kind of order things. I hate risk. Like I don't like risk because it hurts your future. I don't want to mortgage my future like the Rams just did for maybe we'll win a Super Bowl in the next two years and then we'll be terrible 2024, 25, 26, 27, 28. I like to have the future still very bright I want the future to have multiple options for us, and I want to win in the present. Even if I knock us down a notch in the present, if I add six years of opportunity, that's the path I'm going to take. So when I look at Sam Darnold, I think it's a low-risk, high-reward. Jameis Winston, sign him on a one-year deal, low-risk, high-reward. Jimmy G, if he's a free agent, low-risk, high-reward. Number four, trading up, drafting a quarterback. There's a lot of stock there. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of mortgaging your future to trade four picks to move up to 10 to draft a quarterback that you don't know what he's going to turn into because he has no proof of concept 
at this level. Even Sam Darnold, he doesn't have proof of concept in terms of being able to put together a full season and make the playoffs and win and put up crazy numbers, but he's done enough where we've seen glimpses in the worst case scenario for him career-wise in New York where it's like, okay, I could see it. This guy could play. This guy has something in him. If I put him in my offense, if I put him behind my offensive line, if I give him my run game and my defense and just a healthy environment in my locker room, it could work. And then with Gardner Minshew, he's just never got a fair shot. And then, unfortunately for him, kind of like Sam, because the Jets have the number two overall pick, for Gardner, his team gets the number one overall pick, and you have the best prospect since Andrew Luck in 2012 with Trevor Lawrence at number one. So, of course, his job is gone now in Jacksonville. So if you could get maybe Minshew for a sixth or a seventh, I'd be all over it. Low risk, high reward, 37 touchdowns to 11 picks without any weapons, without a good coach, without anything around him in Jacksonville. He has almost a 4-to-1 touchdown to interception ratio, 66% completion percentage in 2020. He's played 23 career games for the Jaguars, so he's thrown a pick every other game. 11 picks, 23 games, not bad. 37 touchdown passes, not bad. I'm a big fan of Gardner Minshew from a value standpoint. He's turned into a meme because of the way he looks, because of the mustache, because of the mullet, because of the cut jean shorts like he's going to a Tom Petty concert. I get it. But the guy would actually fit, in my opinion, in the Frank Reich offense. And you think back to week one, he's able to take what the defense gives him. We gave him a lot in that game, and I think he went like 19 for 19 at some point against Matt Eberflus's defense in week one. So you give him Frank Reich, you give him our weapons, our offense, our offensive line, our running backs, I think it would work. I really, really do think it would work. And maybe a hit, maybe a strike gold. And that's what I like about number two. And that's why my number two is Sam Darnold and Gardner Minshew because I think they are strike gold players where you could bring them in and nobody's going to bat an eye. It's not going to be like bringing in Matthew Stafford or a guy who there's a lot of hype around. You bring them in for way less and you could strike gold. With Winston, I mean, it's possible you strike gold. Fitzpatrick, there's no gold. I don't think Jimmy G or Wentz or Goff at this point have gold left in them. At number four, of course, you could strike gold, but you're giving up a shitload to move up there to do it. And then Easton, of course, he's already on the roster. So that's why number two for me, trade up Sam Darnold, Gardner Minshew. And I know a lot of people are going to be surprised that those two guys, because they don't have a great body of work or a big body of work in the NFL or that high, but it's because you're not trading a lot to go get them. I think for Minshew, I think it's a sixth, maybe a seventh, maybe both a sixth and a seventh. And then for Sam, I think it's a second. Maybe a second and a fourth, maybe a second and a fifth, maybe two thirds, maybe a third and a fourth. I don't think it's crazy value to get a guy like Sam Darnold, especially when the Jets are picking second and they might go draft a quarterback. So that's my number two, Sam Darnold and Gardner Minshew. Yeah, before I get into my number two, I just want to I do I do want to say this about Carson Wentz because he's not on my list. The reason why he's not on my list is I've been told that Frank Reich really is not interested in having him come to Indianapolis I think he had enough of coaching him. He's turned into a diva in Philadelphia. And I just don't think with that contract and I, I just, I, I don't see it happening. So that's why he's not on my list. If I didn't know that he would have been on my list. So I just yeah. want to put that out there. Can I cross um, him off but, mine? Cause I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know he was a but, diva. Cause I know, I know this, the, the, the whole religion thing doesn't always add up, but I know he's like such a great guy and he's religious and he's like, he's, I, well, I always heard he was a good team. It's more, Luke, it's more about the coaching. He doesn't yeah. take coaching well. Yeah, um, when good. Frank was there, he coached him extremely hard, and that's when he got the best out of him. That's when you got the best Carson Wentz. Since Frank's been gone, the guys that they had there just have not coached him hard, and he's basically become a diva because of it. So he's not been held accountable. Uh, he's developed bad habits. Yeah, he's gotten worse. He's an injury. He's he's become injury prone. His attitude is bad. I just he's not a fit for us. Yeah. And I just I, I, I he's really off don't... my list. Absolutely yeah. off my list. He talked me into it. He's gone. Yeah. So that's why he's not on my list. Um. But as far as who my number two guy is, is Matt Ryan. A lot of people think Matt Ryan's washed. I don't. I do think his contract is going to be an issue. There's a chance he's released. There's a chance we trade for him. This might be a situation where we got to get a pick back again because the contract is insane. So I'm not sure if he's going to be available. I would think he would be. 
I don't know if they're going to release him. I've had Atlanta fans say they're going to keep him and whatever. But if you're rebuilding, why do you keep Matt Ryan? You just you take the hit, you take the dead cap hit, you start the rookie. They're gonna mm-hmm. they're gonna draft the quarterback. You and start they're at the rookie. Four, I think they're drafting fourth. Right, and you're and they're gonna take a quarterback, and so. You know, you, you you draft the rookie, you let him play. That's what you do in a rebuild. So I don't and, – and Ryan's not going to want to sit around and back him up. I think he's going to be available, even though I've been told by Atlanta fans he won't be. And I, I just think he's a great option. I think he's young, he's four years younger than Rivers was, or three years. He's 35, and he's still got a lot of good football in him. I mean, he's on the backside of his career, obviously, but he's still playing at a high level. The games that Atlanta lost just last year, for the most part, or because their defense was terrible, and so was their coach. The, the time management. I mean, they were the they were the NFC versus of the Chargers. They just they found ways to blow games, um, just insane ways to blow fourth quarter leads. You know, I'm, some of that is on you know him, but a lot of it's on their coach and their crappy defense. So I think that Matt Ryan would fit right into our offense. He he he's great with you know reading defenses, and he's great with getting the ball off and. You know, playing with our offensive line and a legit running game and, you know, some young weapons. And I do think we're going to go out and sign a wide receiver or draft one to add to, you know, our core of wide receivers. I, I just think it's a great match. I think Reich, Reich likes veteran quarterbacks. I think he would do a great job with them. I think Reich, I think Ryan would have a big year. I think we'd win the division. I think we'd, we'd be competitive for a Super Bowl. I, th- I still think he's that good. So... Is he what he was? No, but he's still good enough to win with and gives us a great chance to compete for the next few years while we either, you know, get Jacob Eason ready to play or until we you know, find the right guy in the draft that we want to trade up and get, which obviously is going to be my number one thing, but we'll get to that in a second. This is my second option. I just still think Matt Ryan has good football left in him. I think he, he wants to go to a situation where he's got an opportunity to win a Super Bowl. I think Indianapolis is a perfect spot for that. I think we're only going to get better. And uh, I think, you know, it's really out of all the matches, I think, you know, him, I think Darnold's a good match. I think this is a good match. And I certainly would love to see him in Indianapolis for the right price. Before I get into my number one, let me just say the pipe dream would be Rodgers, maybe Dak if he's available in free agency, Deshaun Watson. None of those three are going to happen. So I'm crossing all three of those off. So if you say, oh, my God, you'd rather have Matt Ryan than Aaron Rodgers? No, I just don't think Aaron Rodgers is a possibility. My number one is Patrick Mahomes. Well, guess what? He's not going to be available ever. So Aaron Rodgers, I would love him. I thought all those rumors after they lost was just an in the moment. He was upset. He said something he shouldn't have said. Then we started to play connected dots back to Jordan Love last year and the disappointment of the loss and everything, and them not giving him maybe the proper weapons or defense to win, he was aggravated. Dak, I think he proved to be more valuable to Dallas, hurt, than healthy. So I think he'll be back, and if he doesn't resign, they'll just slap him with another franchise tag. I don't think he'll be available. And then Deshaun Watson, I think he does put on another uniform next year. I don't see them trading him within the division to the Colts, but... Deshaun Watson being available could lead to one of these other things. Like let's say Deshaun Watson gets traded to the 49ers and then they buy out Jimmy G and then he's available. Maybe then we sign Jimmy Garoppolo. But my number one option is Matt Ryan. It was your second option. It's my first option. And I think it's because Matt Ryan is the most similar. Because last year my number one option was, honest to God, Phillip Rivers. And we said it in March. We said it before. You know, we said it in January, February. We wanted Phillip Rivers because we liked that he came in Low risk, high reward. He gets a lot of money, whatever. Low risk, high reward. You bring him in, and he's smart. He can get the ball off quick. He'll fit the offense. He's a veteran. If you draft a guy, if you, you know, Jacob Eason, whatever, he'll give that guy a veteran presence. You'll be able to learn from him, develop under him. And I think Matt Ryan does very similar things. Now, it's a little bit different because he's under contract. So if he doesn't get bought out, you're going to have to trade for him. I don't know what all that would look like. But if Matt Ryan's available, whether it be via trade, I don't think you're going to have to give up a ton to get him. And then if he gets bought out and he's a free agent, I would definitely be interested in signing him. He'll be 36 week one next year. So you get a couple years younger than Rivers and you get a similar player. I don't think Matt Ryan is quite as smart in terms of ability to read the defense, pre-snap and all that stuff. But he'll make up for that with being a little bit more athletic than Phillip Rivers, who had no athleticism. And then Ryan's still a really smart guy. So you're not losing that much 
with the football IQ, you're gaining a little bit with a you know slight mobility. I'm just talking about getting away from a, a pass rush. I'm not talking about busting a 15, 20, 25 yard run, but you get a little bit more athletic. Like Rivers, super, super, super durable. 205 games, 205 starts out of a possible 208 since drafted back in 2008. So he's only missed three games in his entire career, including playoffs, and he's only missed one game dating back to 2010. So he's super durable, smart guy. Last year, 2020 stats, kind of like Deshaun Watson, different player, totally different player, of course, but kind of like Deshaun Watson, his stats don't match his team's record. Like you look at Deshaun Watson's stats last year and you would say, wow, he went 11 and five. He went 12 and four and they went four and 12. And then Matt Ryan, same thing, four and 12, but he had a 65% completion percentage, 4,581 yards, 26 touchdowns, 11 picks. If I read you that stat line, Jason, what would you have said? 10 wins, 11 wins? Yeah, I mean, he obviously he played well enough to get him in the playoffs. Exactly. The assumption would be that guy went to the playoffs. They won 10, 11, 12 games, and they went to the playoffs with the season he put up statistically. So I think if you bring in Matt Ryan, it'll kind of be like running it back with Rivers, but a little bit younger, which gives you even more time to find the future franchise quarterback. Because everything to me is extending your ability to win now, continuing to win now without – dampering the future and you see so many teams just throw the kitchen sink in to go up and get a quarterback and they have nothing like right now the like even you look at the Giants Daniel Jones you look at the Redskins Dwayne Haskins you look at the Rams trading up for Jared Goff and all these teams they just they're so in the moment like the Giants had a great what 15 year run with Eli Manning and the second he's done okay the first round we have to go get a quarterback the first quarterback we see we're just gonna go snag in the first round and then the following year you suck and Justin Herbert's on the board and you know how many giant fans I've heard bitch and moan not that they drafted Daniel Jones and they could have got Herbert the next year they bitched that Justin Herbert didn't come out a year early. And to them, I say, why did you react? Why did Dave Gettleman run out and grab the first quarterback he saw? The first quarterback he saw. If you go out with the first chick you see, then it's probably not going to be a very healthy marriage. Like you have to, you have to be patient. Patience will bring everything to you. So that's what I love about Matt Ryan. Because last year we bought ourselves a year. We didn't go crazy. Could you imagine if we did something outlandish and we traded up and we grabbed a quarterback we didn't really love last year? That's how you put yourself in a pickle long term. So I think Matt Ryan does everything that Rivers did plus gives you two extra years of age to find that next guy for that next Patrick Mahomes to fall into your lap. Because they knew that Alex Smith wasn't the answer in Kansas City years ago. But they never jumped the gun. They never just ran up and got into the top 10 to get into the top 10 to take a guy to take a guy. They never did that. And it worked out for them. And I think we are built so well offensively, defensively. And we still have other needs too. Like that's the other thing here that I think everybody's forgetting. You get a guy like Matt Ryan. You don't love a quarterback in the first round. You get your left tackle. And then, boom, that's another cornerstone piece we could cross off the board. You develop him for a year, and then you wait one more year. And then maybe next year, you're drafting 24th, and at 16, there's a guy that Ballard is drooling over. He can't not take this player, and then he moves up to 16. He gets him, and then, boom, all of a sudden, you have your next franchise quarterback for the next 20 years. And I think in my in like in my brain that is the perfect ideal situation. So I know it's not fun to not have that guy. I know we don't want to see retread after retread and go from, you know, Philip Rivers to Matt Ryan to 30 to 30 to 30. I know eventually we want that 22-year-old to come in. And maybe it's Jacob Beeson. We want that guy to come in and be the guy and be Andrew Luck and everybody has his jersey week 1 and and have a guy who's ours, that we draft, that we develop, that we ride throughout the course of his career. I want that more than anybody, but I just think that we have to be patient over time. So my number one option, Matt Ryan, former MVP, 
has been to a Super Bowl, so he has some playoff experience, has some Super Bowl experience. He probably wants to forget that Super Bowl, but he has some Super Bowl experience. He's won an MVP. He's been a first-team All-Pro, so he's got all those accolades. He has all that experience. He's a smart guy, insanely durable, and maybe he would talk Anthony Costanzo out of retirement because they're both Boston College grads. <laughs> hey, you never know, man. For me, my number one, and this I think for the next probably will be my number one until we get our franchise guy, is trading up. Now, this is obviously contingent on – and it's not Trevor Lawrence. He, you know it's not going to be Trevor Lawrence. But this is obviously contingent on Ballard identifying a guy, whether that be Fields or – Lance or the kid from BYU, like it, 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 whoever it is, if he thinks that's the guy, then I'm team trade up. You go out, you get your franchise quarterback, and then and then to me, if you do that, then you have to release Eason. There's no point. I mean, that, that's basically saying to Eason, you're not the guy, and you're going to want to bet behind that guy that you trade up for. So you're going to have to go out and sign a Fitzpatrick or somebody like that or a Dalton or whatever to back them up. Because I'm the type of person, even though you know, uh, you may and, and maybe you let them compete in, tra- in, tra- in training camp. Dalton, Fitzpatrick, and and the rookie that we trade up for, and whoever wins, you know, is a starter. But at some point in that season, that kid is going to be the starter, and then you just let him go. To me, that's what you do. I've always been a proponent of playing young quarterbacks because the best learning you can do, in my opinion, is on the field. You can't – you learn some on the sideline, but you learn more in the fire. And so, you know, I, I would be – I think I would be almost more on board with playing the rookie, whoever that is, and just riding with them because in the, in this day and age, rookies can win. I mean, you look at Lamar Jackson, you look at a lot of guys, you could come in and win. So my number one is always going to be if there's a guy there that Ballard loves because I trust him so much and he, and he thinks he can get him and he – I mean, do it. Because that's what's going to put this franchise in the upper echelon of the AFC for the next 10 years if you get that guy. So that's always going to be number one for me. I don't know if that's an option. Obviously, I don't know what Ballard's thinking. I don't know if there's a guy he loves. But if there is, then that's always going to be my number one option. I do like the Ryan option. I like the Darnold option. But this is my number one option. Because when there's a franchise guy there, you got to try to go get him. And And this is a year where there's a lot of good quarterbacks. So, and you're going to have to trade up to get them. I think they're all going to be gone by 15. Even Mac Jones, I think is going to be gone. So yeah, this is, this is my number one thing. And, and, you know, if you can do that and you go up and get your guy, then, then it's an issue you don't have to worry about for the next 10 years. And, and then, like I said, if you get that guy, then you, you, it's, it's to me, you cut, you have to cut, you trade Jacob Eason or release Jacob Eason because you have to have a veteran quarterback there that can teach that young kid how to be a professional, the correct way to study film, the correct way to do all the right things and, and be a good leader. You need a guy that's got that experience. And as much as I like Jacob Eason, it was, that was a low risk pick. So if we, if we, if we re- end up having to release him, it's really not that big of a deal because it wasn't that much draft capital to begin with. That said, I still, you know, if this doesn't happen, I still think there's a chance Jacob Eason develops into something, but I think it's going to take time. But if you see that guy and you go get that guy in the upper echelon of this first round, Jacob Eason doesn't have a role anymore. He's not, I mean, the, you're basically saying, we think this guy's our guy. You're not that guy. So you have to release him and bring in a, veteran quarterback again to help that rookie along it makes it so much easier in the quarterback room I mean who knows maybe we get Eason back on the practice squad I doubt it but you never know so for me that's my number one option team trade up get that guy if he's there obviously this is contingent on that guy being you know Chris Ballard seeing that guy and thinking that guy is the franchise quarterback yeah and if that guy's there and they draft him and they move up and Ballard believes it's the guy then it's automatically number one on my list too because that's the goal. Like We all want that guy eventually. Sooner, the better. But again, the patience, and I know we're in lockstep on that. So if that guy's there, Ballard believes it, boom, that's number one for me. When I wrote my list though, I was kind of thinking week one starter, which is another reason why I put it fourth because I'm thinking, okay, if we draft a guy like Fields or Wilson or Lance or Jones, they might not be ready week one. So then I would have that 
as a lower tier for my week one starter. And then I would bring in a vet like Fitzpatrick or somebody. And even, and I know this is probably not going to happen because you might have to trade for Matt Ryan. I would love Matt Ryan and a rookie from this class because then we get what we got last year or wanted last year with a rookie behind Phillip Rivers. And then like the same thing with Sam Darnold. Like I don't know where Sam Darnold's going to be week one. And I think that Wright could get the most out of him. But in my ideal world, Sam Darnold was coming in with Phillip Rivers coming back on a one-year deal. Because could you imagine if we got Sam Darnold, it would have been the fourth year of his rookie contract. You bring in Phillip Rivers for one more year, and then you hit Sam Darnold with the fifth year rookie option for being a first round pick in 2018. And then you have him with one year experience, one year to degaze himself, one year under Frank Reich in that offense, working with Marcus Brady, battling Jacob Eason and developing behind a Hall of Famer in Phillip Rivers. To me, that was ideal. Or this year to draft a quarterback in the first round and have him develop under Phillip Rivers. Or even if Eason were to get another year of development under Phillip Rivers and then he turns into a franchise quarterback. I don't want to completely write off Jacob Eason. Like all those options would have been awesome for me because the roster is so good right now. And of course, we need a pass rusher. We need a corner. We need a left tackle. I get these are all big spots and important positions. I think it could be filled. I really think we could patch up a couple things here and there. And we could go out and we could compete for a Super Bowl next year. But if you have to patch up all that and you add a rookie quarterback to your week one starter, you know, there's just going to be a lot of growing pains for this team. And then next year will probably be a year where you feel yourself out. You develop your quarterback. You don't really compete. Maybe you make the playoffs at 10 and 6, but you don't because I don't think next year is going to be as crazy with all the 11 and 5 teams as this year was. Maybe you get into the playoffs. The quarterback gets a touch, a taste of the playoffs. But I still love the idea of a rookie veteran guy like Matt Ryan parlayed with a rookie or something of that sort as my number one option. But the goal is eventually for Ballard to get that guy. That franchise guy, 10, 15-year guy, he's a Colt, he's drafted, he's developed by the organization, by Frank Reich, by Chris Ballard, by Marcus Brady. That is the goal, and hopefully it's Jacob Eason. And this is a big thing, Jason, I don't understand. When you go on Colts Twitter, of course, we said it before, you have the people that love him irrationally. You have the people that hate him irrationally. What I don't understand is the people who hate him irrationally, why? In a perfect world, isn't Jacob Eason the guy? Like, if I could guarantee you right now that Jacob Eason has the same career trajectory as Fields, Wilson, Lance, or Jones, and all those guys, the Colts would have to trade up, let's say, to 10 to get one of those guys. And they're all good pros. They're all B-plus pros. And you could get the same thing, or just slightly worse, out of Jacob Eason. Wouldn't you hold on to all your picks and just keep the guy who's been in-house for a year? Of course. So like I, mean, I don't understand here, like they're like but I feel like it's so narrative driven. I feel like there's people who didn't like him last year during the draft, and just because they didn't like him the day we drafted him, just because or just because he's a fourth round pick, they're totally against the idea of a fourth round pick turning into a franchise quarterback. And I don't understand that. Like, why are you so narrative driven? If you're a Colts fan, shouldn't you want the Colts to be able to hold on to all their draft equity and to just to be able to develop Eason and turn him into that guy? If let's say Fields well, is going to be an 87 out of 100. And Jacob Eason's going to be an 85 out of 100. That two little percentage point, isn't that worth holding on to a future first, a future second, a future third, like all those future picks? Or maybe like this year's second, next year's first, next year's third. Like I'd much rather hold on to all those picks and have Eason turn into the exact same prospect that those guys are. It, it, it Listen, it's, it is, and you're, you're making great points, Luke. And a lot of it is is draft round driven. He was taken in the fourth round, therefore he can't be any good. Or, you know, he. I mean, that's a lot of it. And for me, like, my thing is, I wasn't a huge Jacob Eason guy. Like, I, like I, and when I was going through my draft prep, he is not somebody that I would have taken in the first round or the second round, although some people did have him that high. But we got him in the fourth round, and I think, you, you know, when you look at the things that he can do, those things cannot be taught. Yep. Now you got him with Frank Reich. Some of the things that he couldn't do while he's at Washington can be fixed. So 
my thing is let's see the kid play first. Like for both sides, the guy, like there's some guys that are like, let's just start Jacob Eason. And then there's some guys that are like, Jacob Eason's going to suck. He's not anything. He's garbage, whatever. Let's see him play in a preseason game first. Let's see him play some snaps before we toss this kid to the curb. Yep. I mean, that's like the only the only way I get rid of Jacob Eason is if you Ballard sees the guy, right? The guy, the 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 franchise guy, and he goes out and gets him, and that's basically saying he's seen enough from Jacob Eason to know that it's not him. Yep. And okay, I'm all right with that. But if not. I want Jacob Eason on the roster, especially if there's a vet, because I that means that Ballard sees enough in him to keep him on the roster and to keep him as a backup. And that means there's some potential there. Yep, and buy so, some time. Yeah, exactly. So I it's it's and, and I don't know who's right. He might not be good. He might be good. Nobody knows because he hasn't played. And I would also say this if Jacob Eason comes back for his last season in college. He definitely gets drafted higher than the fourth oh, round. Oh, no question. They, there were people last year that had a second-round grade on him, maybe even absolutely. higher than that. And absolutely. that was with barely playing at Washington or in college with the injury at Georgia and then transferring to Washington, having to sit that year and then only playing one year. And then let's say he were to go back to the Pac-12 this year, right? They only played, I think Washington only played like three or four games this year. So how oh. much could his, like, it probably wouldn't have helped him that much as a player. Like maybe his draft stock would have risen and he would have went earlier in the first or second round. But for him as a player, I think going to the NFL and sitting behind Phillip Rivers did more for him as a player and him as, you know, an NFL prospect than going back to Washington and playing another year of college football because he didn't even have a real year of college football. Those kids at Washington this year are really across the Pac-12, whether it be USC or UCLA or any of those schools. All those kids got gypped this year because they started late and they only played a handful of games. It wasn't a real college football season for the whole Pacific, that whole Pacific West Coast. So I think for him personally, he's probably like, oh my God, for all the people that got screwed over by COVID, Jacob Eason and his career really benefited from COVID because he probably made a big decision. Well, obviously he made a big decision. He decided to declare for the draft. And at the time, he might be thinking, wow, look at Joe Burrow. Different situation, different school, more talent around him. But he's a sixth round pick if he declares after his junior year. He goes back as a senior and he goes, has one of the great years of all time in the SEC, breaks every record under the sun, is the first overall pick. More guaranteed money, just everything better about the situation for Joe Burrow. God bless him. If you're Jacob Eason, you got to be thinking about that. Wow, if I come back, if I throw 40 touchdown passes, if we win the Pac-12, if we get a big bowl game, I could rise my draft stock and be a first round pick and I could make X amount guaranteed money my first couple years in the league. So that was a big decision he made. The day he gets drafted, he's probably thinking, ah, man, you know what? I might have screwed up. I got drafted 200th or 130th or whatever the Colts got him. I went in the fourth round. I don't have the guaranteed money I could have got if I stayed one more year of college. But with the way COVID hit, Jacob Beeson really, really, really lucked out. No matter what happens in his future, even if he goes somewhere else, the knowledge he got from sitting behind Phillip Rivers for a year and being in a Frank Reich offense, who, again, is a quarterback whisperer, say what you want about Frank Reich inside the red zone, first and goal from the one, third and in inches, and some of the things he does that we disagree with. He's a great developer of quarterbacks. That's his bread and butter. And if you're Jacob Eason, you got a year of that. You got a year of Marcus Brady, who I think is going to be a tremendous offensive coordinator. Nick Sirianni, you had a loaded offensive staff last year with two guys right now that are head coaches in the National Football League. You got Jacoby Brissett, who's not a great quarterback, but he's a great pro, and you can learn a lot from him. Walter Payton, man of the year, has starting experience, learned some things from Tom Brady, learned some things from Bill Belichick, learned some things from Andrew Luck, and you have all that knowledge. And then you have Phillip Rivers, who's a Hall of Fame player, who's thrown 420 touchdowns. You even got to see what meaningful football is in the playoffs up close. You weren't playing in the games, but you saw the preparation. Like He got to see all that last year. And that puts him ahead of the curve. So if you're Jacob Easton, like you really got to be counting your lucky stars or whatever the saying is that everything happened the way it happened. Because I would say 9 out of 10 college athletes got 
you know what over by COVID. And he's one that really benefited, especially being a Pac-12 player. If he was in the SEC, it'd be a little bit different if he was still at Georgia because, you know, Georgia plays a full season. But the Pac-12 played, I think they played four games. Like, I think Washington only had four games on their schedule this year. What's going to, you know, what's going to change? I just looked it up. What'd they play? They played five. I just looked it up. Five games. So, yeah. So, like, what, you know, how much is your draft stock really going to rise from that? And then if it does rise, besides the guaranteed money, which is great, you're not going to learn as much in college as you're going to learn one year under Phillip Rivers in the National Football League with a really good offensive-minded head coach and a quarterback in Frank Reich. So, to wrap all that up, I think Jacob Beeson landed in such a great spot, and I think it's really going to do him wonders in the long run, whether, whether that be in Indianapolis or somewhere else. Yeah, and, and just to wrap up the show, Luke, I, I would say this. this What this exercise did for me, and I don't know about you but because I, I can't speak for you, but uh, for me, just doing this has shown me there's options. Like everybody oh, yeah. acts like there's no, there's no options. We're, we're screwed. We didn't get Stafford. So, Our season's dude, over. We're, the, one we guy, guys... the one guy tweeted at me this morning, Ballard struck out on Matthew Stafford. I think we're going to go to Jacoby or Eason now. Oh, God. If you Ugh. strike out, if you lead off a game, right? Mike Trout leads off top of the first. He strikes out. Is that it? He's not going to get a hit? He's still going to have three, four at-bats the rest of the game. You still have eight innings to play with. You might go yep. to extras. There's a lot of options. There will be more opportunity this off. Technically, Jason, technically, the offseason hasn't even started yet. We haven't even had yep. the Super Bowl for the previous season, and people are freaking out about next year's quarterback. Yeah, it's insane, dude. The amount of people on Twitter that have added me about Jacoby Brissett makes my head want to, I just makes me want to light myself on fire. I can't say this enough, Luke. And I know you've said it too. We've both been told Jacoby Brissett is not being Finito. resigned. He's gone. Yes. And, and listen to the people that are like, well, Chris Ballard, you know, raved about, let's not write him off. Let's not write him off. Do you know what Chris Ballard's trying to do? He's trying to do a solid for a solid player and a great teammate, a great guy in the community. He's trying to to say positive things about this guy to help him get his next job. Yep. He's not going to come on there and say, uh, Jacoby's terrible. We don't want him back. He's the worst quarterback in the league. We, uh, he's yeah. not going no. to say those things because that's not who Chris Ballard is. You saw him when he talked about Marlon Mack. He damn near got emotional talking yep. about Marlon and, Mack. And Walker. And think about what, what do all these guys have in common, Jason, besides the fact that they're probably not going to be back they're great people they're well, great, great they're people great but people. there's one more there's one they're great people they're probably not going to be back but there's one more overlapping similarity with jacoby Brissett, anthony walker and marlon mack they're all leaders they're all leaders but they're all 2017 ballard first year guys in indianapolis that's you true, grow yeah. a different type of connection like your middle school friends your grammar school friends you have a different type of bond with them they're your neighborhood friends growing up than you do maybe with guys you met in college or guys you met at work. So that's day one. Like that's his day one quarterback, even though he wasn't, you know, that's not your ideal quarterback on the field, but it's still right. a guy that he knows so well. And he was there for him when Andrew Luck retired, didn't play well, but he was there for him when Andrew Luck retired. He took a back seat to Phillip Rivers this year. He loved everything about Jacoby as a man, as a person. He's not going to tarnish his name in NFL circles, especially him, because Chris Ballard knows every GM in the league listens to him. Every GM in the league takes his word. So if he says, I love Jacoby, I think he could start in this league, there's probably a GM out there that's dumb enough to take that for what it's worth and sign him maybe as a starter on a bad team. So I think that's what that was. Same thing with Anthony Walker. We don't anticipate him being back for multiple reasons, but I promise you one of the reasons isn't that he's a great guy. So it's not always about that. Like, And you're not going to throw a guy under the bus that you like as a human no. being. And knowing Ballard's character, even if he was a trash human being, Ballard wouldn't throw him under the bus. And, no. you know, that's just the way Ballard rolls. He's going to compliment guys. He's going to – he wants – and Ballard even said it in the same presser that everybody ran with the Jacoby line. In the same presser, Ballard said we put a lot – we dump a lot of resources into player development. And if we can't pay them, I want a guy to go get paid by somebody else. That – Luke, that is a great point. And that is what I love about Chris Ballard. He – he lo like, he loves his players. He really does. Like, when he says – you know, when he gets choked up talking about Marlon Mack and how brokenhearted he was when he, you know, had that horrible injury, he he loves that guy. And he, I mean, he wants, he, Marlon Mack not only deserves the money, 
but he wants him to get the money, and he knows it's not going to be here, but he wants him to get it somewhere and or, and go out and have a great career because he loves that guy. Yep. And that's – you know, it's it's there's never any vindictiveness about Ballard. And when guys come out – like you mentioned Brissett. Brissett came in, if you remember, and was basically thrown into the fire because we had – basically you were playing quarterback, Luke. I mean, Scott wow. Tolzien was out wow. there tossing. <laughs> he was he was tossing pick sixes all over the field and uh, and uh, and for against the 49ers, right, Chuck? No, I'm just kidding. It was against the Rams, but Chuck thought <laughs> he was in San Francisco for that game. But he was out there tossing interceptions. Listen, so, guys, you know, I can't believe the 49ers just made that trade for Matthew Stafford. They kicked our ash. The 49ers kicked our ash. But like, what I'm saying is, he had no. I mean, he lit, had he was there for a week. He came in, was thrown into the fire, made no excuses. And he actually – Luke and I talked about this off air the other day. Brissett played real. I mean, all things considered in that 4-12 and season, he wasn't bad. No. He was thrown into a situation where he didn't know the offense. He made a couple of – I mean, we go back to that San Francisco game. He made two or three, like, just insane throws in that game. And, I mean, so what I'm saying is if you're a good person – even if you're not a great player, he wants the best for you. And yep. he's not ever going to say anything bad about a guy that's busted their ass for this organization, Brissett, Mac, Walker, all those guys. Mm -hmm. He's never going to say a cross word about them because he wants them to get a job. He wants them to get paid. He wants them to have the opportunity to play somewhere else. And I promise you, when free, agent starts, if people, free agency starts, if people call about those three guys, he's going to give them glowing reports of because course. all three of those guys are tremendous. They're tremendous locker room guys, great leaders, and somebody – if you could pay him, you want on your team. Obviously, you know, Walker wants to start, so he's going to want starter money. Brissett wants to start. He's going to want starter money. And then Mac wants to start, and he's going to want starter money. We can't give him that, so he wants him to get it somewhere else. And that's what I love about Ballard. There's not a vindictive bone in that guy's body. He wants the best for the guys, even if it's not here, and I love that about him. Yep, and the one player Ballard – probably hated more than any other player to walk through these doors the last four years. The worst thing he said about that guy was, we'll probably move on. He never That's threw it. Eric Ebron under the bus. No. You know, if you're not going to give it to him, if you're not going to be respectful, if you're going to be a problem in the locker room, he's not going to be glowing about you. He's not going to be hyping you up so you get the most money possible. And if I were Eric Ebron, I would not have been happy about that Pittsburgh contract. Actually, his value after Detroit – was better than his value after Indianapolis, and he had a Pro Bowl season in Indy. You could have made an argument yeah. he had an All-Pro season that first year in Indy when he caught, what, 13 touchdown passes, had a rushing touchdown, caught another touchdown in the playoffs. He had a great year with Andrew Luck in 2018, and his value went down, and Ballard not showing interest, A, and then Ballard not speaking highly of him, B, were probably two huge reasons why, on top of all the drops and on top of his production oh. dipping, when Jacoby and, he, the and he quit on his team. And he, he quit on his team. Quit on but his team. Yeah. the general point is, the only thing he said about Ebron was, we'll probably move on. He couldn't even entertain the question. He never said a good word about him. So that just goes to show, and that's the worst possible case. So right. that just goes to show the class of Chris Ballard. But yeah, Jacoby will not be back. So anybody out there saying Jacoby's going to be back, absolutely not. And if we're going to lose this year, I'd rather lose with Jacob Eason. And that's not a shot 100%. at Jacoby. I just, I've seen no. it too many times. If I punch you like 30 times in the face and then I say, would you rather me kick you in the leg? You'll probably just say, yeah, switch it up. If it's going to hurt either way, at least switch it up and give me something new because I'm sick yeah. and tired of getting punched in the face. So we've been punched in the face by Jacoby for 30 starts. i rather yeah. have some type enough. of upside. Yeah, we've with seen enough. Jacob Eason. <laughs> exactly. We've seen enough. And, yeah, and, like I... and, and also, one, oh, sorry, Jason, one more thing. If you're Ballard, this is year five. Of course yep. you want to win. You want to make the playoffs for the third time in five years. But if you're Chris Ballard, could you imagine if Jacoby Brissett's your starter for the third time as a full-time starter in five years? Yeah. To be honest, that's one of the reasons why I wouldn't even bring him back as a backup just in case. No, because no, no. To be honest, I still believe Jacoby's one of the top backups in this league. I think he's somewhere from like 35 to 39 in the National Football League. So, or maybe even a little higher. Maybe like, maybe even like a low tier starter, like 30 to 35 in the National Football League. But I just don't want to bring him back because I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it from Stephen Holder and from Kevin Bowen and from Zach Kiefer and Jim and all those. Like, I don't want to hear it. We've been through yeah. that. We rode that ride. It was, it was, it was what it was. We're, we're, I'm done. Go get paid. 
go play somewhere. Please, just go somewhere else. And I'll root for Jacoby. Right. As long as he's yeah. not in our division playing against us, I'll root for Jacoby. I just don't want him here. And as a backup, he is a solid backup. But it's just I've seen him start 30 times, and I just can't hear it. Maybe we should go to Jacoby. Imagine we bring. Imagine we draft a rookie and, J- oh, and Jacoby's God, the backup, dude. and the rookie Ugh. struggles out the gate as rookies Ugh. do, like Miami yeah. this year. I have friends that are Miami Dolphin fans, and even when Tua was struggling, they didn't want to hear about Fitzpatrick. They knew their ceiling with Ryan Fitzpatrick. To them, it was about right. Tua. It was about the growth of Tua. If we miss the playoffs, so be it. We're going to develop the future of this franchise because we believe in him. So if we believe in Lance, or we believe in Mac Jones, or whoever it might be, and we trade up and we go draft them, and Jacoby's sitting behind them, and they stink the first month, I'm going to want them to stick it out. I don't want to hear, oh, bring in Jacoby, bring in Jacoby, or if it's Jacob Eason, bring in Jacoby. I don't want to hear it because we know what the ceiling is. I'd rather have a rookie learn on the run, go through the rookie growing pains, and have somebody else behind them like... I don't know, Andy Dalton has their backup or somebody like right. that for argument's sake. So that's just the way I feel about that. I love Jacoby as the Walter Payton man of the year, as a teammate, as a locker room guy. I don't need to hear his name pop up as a suggestion time after time after oh. time to be our starting quarterback. And we even heard it this year. Philip Rivers, who's going to the Hall of Fame, struggled in September, and we heard about Jacoby. I don't want to hear it with a rookie. And even though I'm all about competition and I'm all about earning your spot, I don't want a rookie quarterback to open up the Indy star and to have to read about how he's a bust and they should bring in Jacoby the first month of his rookie season. Phillip Rivers is a Hall of Fame guy who's been through it. He's heard every type of criticism you could ever hear. He has thick skin. He could handle it. A rookie quarterback, of course you want a guy with thick skin. Of course you want a guy who's able to handle that type of criticism. But you also don't want it to be with that retread of Jacoby. If anything, I'd rather be with you know with a guy who has promise. Not yeah. a guy who has nothing that's, that's already burnt out in Indianapolis. The the media really made like Jacoby unbearable. Like not not him as a person, but just the name <laughs> unbearable because I mean they just kept pushing that. But listen. That's over. He's not going to be back. People seem to think he's still under contract. He is a free agent. He will not be re-signed. Walker will not be re-signed. Uh, the only one of the three that Luke mentioned that I think there's even a chance that is re-signed is Mac, and I think it be, would be for a really, really cheap one-year deal. But even that I don't think is likely. But what I was saying kind of to wrap up the show, Luke, was that you know I saw a lot of you know people losing their minds. I saw a lot of people, you know, just a lot of stuff on Twitter. And what this exercise that we just did, Luke and I, des- was designed to do was to show you Colt fans that that you know are down or whatever, that we didn't get Stafford. There are options out there, and this is just a few of them. I'm sure there's, there's stuff that we didn't talk about in this podcast that Ballard has up his sleeve. It, it, that's why the guy's the best at what he does. He doesn't show you his hand. There's something up that guy's sleeve. I promise you. There's a player we did not mention in this podcast. Maybe that my he's pipeline. Prob- Maybe my pipeline of Rogers, Watson, and Dak. Three guys that you, I don't think will be available, at least for Indianapolis. You, nev- you, you never you, know, you never man. Know. You just you never know. So, but but my point is that you know there's no reason to worry. There's no reason to, to trip. There's no reason to get frustrated. There's no reason. I mean, people are acting like. And I, I tweeted this out like last night. Our fan base is acting like Chris Ballard is some incompetent guy that's just going to go out and sign a turd or a trash can to be our quarterback. He's not going to do that. This guy is brilliant. He's probably one of the smartest GMs in the game. He's not going to be tied to somebody that's going to get him fired. That's not going to happen. He's going to go out and find the best possible option for this team for now and the future. That is what he's going to to do i promise you that and like i said we did this to show you guys there are options out there some are better than others and and you know we'll see what happens but i you gotta trust in the guys look look at his resume look at his past history when has he ever failed us when he's had an off season to attack something defensive backs defensive line linebackers offensive line i mean he's a wide receiver i mean he's tight end I mean, he's, it, it, now it's quarterback now it's left tackle 
defensive end. Those are the three spots he's got to attack this offseason, and he's going to, whether that be free agency, whether that be through a trade, or whether that be through a draft pick that's those three spots will absolutely be addressed i promise you and honestly it's crazy while everybody was losing their mind it was like that meme where the guy's standing in uh, you know in the burning house and everything's burning around him while i was reading twitter i kind of felt like that guy Especially you know like i'm every- what the rams gave up once yeah, we I mean, saw how yeah. much the rams gave up it really changed the game if i saw the rams gave up a second round pick and that was it i would have been pissed i would have been like come on bad we could have topped that right even i still would have thought that maybe he has something better up his sleeve but, you know, I would have been upset. But like I said, I was like, it was like I was that meme, the guy standing yeah, the in the dog. Well, it's a dog, right? Like a yellow yeah, dog. Yeah, the dog, and the dog in the house. Like, and I was just chill. Like, I'm relaxed, calm, not nervous at all, and everything's burning around me. That's how I felt. Yeah. Because I honestly, Luke, I wasn't even tripping. No, like, no. I just Once I saw, all. I was tripping for 30 seconds when I saw Mass Stafford to the Rams. I was like, damn it. And then I open it. And I see two firsts, a third, and Goff. And, Jared and I was Goff, like, yeah. well, damn. Good for the Lions. <laughs> That's all I can say. Yeah, good for we the were, Lions. We were, we, we were not giving them that. <laughs> no. And good for the Rams because they didn't get bit by Dan Campbell on the way out. <laughs> oh, man, what a show. This has been a classic, Luke. This has been a classic show. Yeah, it was fun going through all these quarterbacks. Hopefully one of them or – Two of them end up on the Colts roster, or three of them, at least in training camp. If you get Eason, you get a rookie, and you get a vet. So we'll see what happens, but it should be fun, and it should be interesting as we'll now start to get into the free agency stuff. It's not really fun when the playoffs are going on. You have the Super Bowl, but now we'll start to get into all that. In the upcoming weeks, as we get closer and closer to March, throughout the month of February, we'll start to do free agency. We'll start with the in-house, and then we'll do other stuff. If quarterback news at any time breaks, We'll get into that and then draft right around the corner. Less than 100 days, like 90-something days, maybe 80-something, 88, 89 days until the NFL draft. So we're in that ballpark now as all that stuff will start to get going and start to heat up over the next couple days and the next couple weeks. And we'll be right here to cover it all right here on the For the Culture Podcast.